Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Hayden Lee and your host from the Energy Market Authority of Singapore. Thank you once again for joining us at the Seoul Energy Insights webinar series. Today's webinar, Revolutionizing Change for the, Fu for the Great of the Future, is held in partnership with Claren Events, organizer of the Seoul Partner Event, Future of the Great. To start today's webinar, I would like to welcome Ms. Saumia Rao from PwC for her presentation. Ms. Rao, please. Uh, thank you, Aidan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all this afternoon to the webinar and panel discussion on revolutionizing change uh, for the period of the future. We have a distinguished panel of experts with us today. Uh, but before we get into the panel discussion, uh, let me walk you through uh, a paper that we published about ASEAN's readiness for energy transition. By way of introduction, my name is Somya Rao, and I work with PwC in Singapore um, with a focus on the infrastructure sector. Um, our infrastructure team globally comprises of a thousand plus professional staff uh, who basically work with clients, either government or private sector, to solve their commercial financial issues in the infrastructure sector be it greenfield or brownfield assets. In the recent past, um, I've been doing increasingly more work in the power and utility space in the region, more on the renewable energy side as well. Uh, let me start my presentation with this. Uh, can we go to the first slide, please? Thank you. Um, ASEAN is one of the fastest developing uh, regions around the world, a home to more than 650 million people. This number is expected to continue growing rapidly, with the estimated population reaching around 723 million by 2030, behind economies like China and India. Economically, although the ASEAN region has seen a tar, sharp contraction from the pandemic, the region is expected to bounce back quickly uh, to its GDP. And the region is expected to continue growing rapidly to become the fourth largest global economy, exceeding EU and Japan. Over the next decade, ASEAN is expected to undergo further urbanization as well as industrialization, with more than $2 trillion of infra investment uh, expected in the region, and total energy demand to meet this is expected to skyrocket, uh, growing up to 60% increase in overall energy demand by 2040, on the back of increasing industrial activities, growing population, and rising income levels. Moving on. As such, uh, this places a huge, huge pressure on the ASEAN energy sector as energy reserves continue to deplete in the region. ASEAN remains currently a net importer of energy. The region continues to import more than 40% of its total energy supply. Even countries like Indonesia, who are currently a net exporter of energy, this is likely to change within the next few decades. With the mismatch in demand and supply, we observe a growing concern on, on the energy security within ASEAN with the depleting energy reserves. Moreover, the region also sees the need uh, for a diversification of its energy supply to expand the system to cater to the growing demand. And with this, renewable energy is expected to be one of the key solutions uh, to the growing demand. We observe an increasing trend in renewable energy capacity in the region in the recent past. Uh, in the last two decades, the compounded annual growth was as high as 6-7%. This is driven by the region's sustainability agenda, as well as pressures um, on phasing out fossil fuels within the region. Expansion of the renewable energy capacity was also supported, of course, by the declining cost of renewables, such as solar PV, onshore wind, which has only helped support the business case even more. Next slide, please. The region as a whole saw more than 27 billion um, uh, that was invested in renewable power sector in, in the six major Southeast Asian markets between 20, 2006 and 2016. Region-wide initiatives have also been established to facilitate the energy transition in the region. At the heart of this energy transition in ASEAN, we have the ASEAN uh, Plan of Action of Energy Cooperation Phase Two. The roadmap highlights uh, seven key strategies and areas of focus, which also includes uh, the ASEAN power grid, coal and clean coal technology, energy efficiency, conservation, renewable energy, 
and regional energy policy and planning. Uh, this plan takes into account the impacts of COVID pandemic and its recovery plans to establish more ambitious targets to enhance energy security and sustainability within the region. This includes achieving 23% and 35% of renewable energy and total energy supply and installed capacity by 2025. Uh, one of the key achievements under phase one uh, includes the first multilateral power trading which was successfully initiated under the Laos Island, Malaysia, Singapore power integration plan for ASEAN power grid. And this, this initiative is also meant to, meant to facilitate integration of renewable energy into the power system, as well as sharing of renewable resources across countries in the region. Slide, please. Um, in our report, we have identified six key matrices. Um, while I'm presenting a summary here, we have a lot of detail in the report that you can access um, uh, offline too. Uh, we have identified six key matrices to assess the readiness of the ASEAN region in this energy transition. This includes factors such as energy accessibility, reliability, affordability, sustainability, smartness, as well as their participation in energy trading. Starting with accessibility, we considered factors such as electrification rates in member states of ASEAN and developments of rural electrification. Secondly, on energy reliability, we look into the peak demand, uh, which is the highest electricity consumption, as well as installed capacity within the region to derive the reserve margins. Thirdly, we look into energy affordability by considering the percentage of average electricity bill in each household uh, compared to the minimum wage in the country. We also look at sustainability based on grid emission factors um, from the amount of carbon dioxide emissions and electricity generation mix within each country. In energy smartness, we looked at the SP Smart Meter Index, which benchmarks against a total of 85 utilities across 37 countries and markets. Uh, lastly, we also look at uh, the participation of the countries in energy trading by looking at whether there are any existing transmission lines um, between the countries and capacity on these transmission lines. Next slide, please. Based on analysis, uh, we see that majority of the countries within the region have reached some form of um, ability to provide for basic energy needs. However, a lot more uh, can be done in terms of deriving its energy from cleaner sources and doing more in energy smartness and participation in the wider ASEAN energy integration process. Uh, next slide, please. Using this information earlier, we have then positioned countries and segmented them into subgroups and uh, mapped the possible future developments uh, with the y-axis showing maturity of basic energy needs um, and x-axis showing the energy sustainability and smartness of each country. The bubble size kind of represents the GDP of each country. Um, with Myanmar, a lot more has to be done in terms of meeting the basic energy needs. Um, but the other set of countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, um, Philippines, Cambodia, where the basic energy needs for people have been largely met, uh, a lot more can be done in making the future energy uh, mix cleaner and smarter and integration with the region. In Thailand and Singapore in particular, um, more can be done in making the energy smarter and cleaner as, as these countries also uh, increasingly um, embark on increasingly uh, take, undertake more renewable energy um, projects as well as this penetration of electric vehicles and distributed solar generation, um, which is expected in the near future as well. Next slide, please. Uh, in, in this report uh, structure, uh, we've kind of focused on key areas uh, for the energy transition. And we will, uh, first we will provide an overview of the ASEAN energy sector as covered earlier, followed by discussing the future of energy becoming affordable, cleaner, smarter, and more united. Within each of these kind of four topics, uh, we also discuss an overview of the current status, where we include some case studies 
and key findings surrounding the current state of and future targets and what countries can take uh, for the transition to meet the targets. Next slide, please. Firstly, ASEAN um, has achieved significant progress in the electrification of the region. Uh, between 2000, year 2000 and year 2016, more than 170 million people have gained access to electricity. Countries have established very ambitious rural electrification targets, and most ASEAN countries are expected to achieve universal electrification in, in the next few years. Electrification in ASEAN is in line with the goal 7.1 of UNSGD, which aims to achieve universal access to affordable, reliable, and modern energy service by 2030. Besides providing universal access to energy, having affordable energy is crucial in the pursuit of sustainability goals for the region. To access the affordability, to assess the affordability of uh, energy within ASEAN, we took into account several factors, including the average monthly electricity consumption within each country, average electricity tariffs, and looked at the proportion of cost of electricity in household um, earning minimum wages. Also uh, considered that for some countries there are electricity subsidies and take, took that into account when looking at um, affordability. Um, next slide, please. Um, secondly, the future energy sector uh, will become cleaner. Uh, we've identified these key trends in the energy transition within ASEAN, which includes phasing out coal, utility scale, solar, onshore offshore wind, biomass, electric vehicles, distributed energy generation, energy storage, and also um, hydrogen. For each trend, we've identified the countries who've made some progress in each of these areas and the details of which is, is in the report. Um, firstly, for coal within ASEAN, they are still projected to provide large share of ASEAN's power due to its cost and availability in the region. Completely phasing out coal would be impractical in the short term and medium term for ensuring energy security in ASEAN due to the growing energy demand. In terms of development in the sector, though, countries such as Philippines have announced a moratorium on new coal, coal fire power plants. Um, and other countries are also taking active uh, measures and simplifying uh, the structure for renewable energy to, to promote more renewable energy through regulations. In addition, countries like Singapore have stopped financing coal fire power plants. Lastly, ASEAN is looking to leverage technologies such as carbon capture, utilization, and storage to reduce the amount of emissions from coal energy generating technologies. On solar, practically uh, most of the uh, member states have established targets. Similarly, onshore, offshore wind and biomass countries, uh, countries that are endowed with rich wind resource, as well as natural resources, uh, have established targets for wind, cap wind capacity in the country. Next slide, please. Um, we also see the sector becoming more smarter. And this is due to all the dis digital disruptions that you're seeing in the energy sector in this decade. We're looking at technologies, including blockchain, artificial intelligence, IoT, 3D printing for the energy sector. I'll give a few examples here. The blockchain technology, firstly, can be useful in helping us in the reconciliation of energy demand and supply, as well as reducing cost and improving efficiency within energy trading. Blockchain uses the distribution ledger technologies to, to store and execute smart contracts, allowing for things like peer-to-peer -peer energy trading. This in the future will enable households uh, with their own power generation and technology to sell electricity directly to each other through blockchain networks. Similarly, uh, for IoT, it is expected to provide data for on-demand detection and monitoring through the use of sensors. This, this can help to provide, to better provide real-time feedback, uh, which can help to provide better maintenance forecast, bringing about reduced cost, downtime, and man hours. IoT can also help to support the integration of RD by connecting distributed generation sources to smart grids. 
similarly on the construction and management, asset management side, we could see a lot more application of technology like drones. Next slide, please. Lastly, we see then future energy sector uh, and the future uh, grid uh, within the region to be a united one. Currently, we see more than 5.5 gigawatts of interconnection capacity uh, within the region, with at least nine cross-border power grids across the region. There was at least 35 terawatt hours of electricity trade within the region in 2019. This existing Asia power grid is expected to expand uh, with more interconnection capacity. Currently, Thailand and Laos account for most of the interconnection, existing interconnections in the region. The ASEAN power grid is the key initiative in helping enhance this cross-border electricity trade and unifying the energy sector of the future for the region. As the region is expected to see rapid growth in energy demand, electricity trading is expected to improve energy accessibility security, affordability, and sustainability within the region. Currently, most of this trade in APG occurs through bilateral agreements, and this is expected to continue growing. This will help bring about more integrated electric market in the region. However, significant changes, uh, challenges exist, um, including the need to develop market mechanism, achieve standardization of technical standards, to drive power trading within the region. Also, more institutional support, financial initi initiatives may be needed for large scale projects within this, within this uh, area. In the latest initiatives uh, of ASEAN Power Grid, we've seen the two key projects, the Lao Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore Power Integration Project, uh, which um, was announced last week um, as, as being successfully commenced as well as the additional 100 megawatts import of electricity uh, from Malaysia. These two projects will help Singapore um, also to kind of participate more and prepare more for further moves to connect with the regional power grid, as well as achieve Singapore's sustainability agenda to redu reduce carbon emissions. As this region is still developing and economic growth is prioritized, Fossil fuels will still continue to play a prominent role in the coming years. But with declining costs of renewable energy, policymakers are seeing an opportunity to fulfill the energy accessibility goals while driving the transition to a cleaner and energy efficient future. Subsequently, this transition will require incremental uptake of renewable energy and boost uh, energy security as well as uh, managing of supply and demand of electricity, uh, boost the smart grids to manage the supply and demand of electricity in the region. The region has stepped up its collaboration, um, collaboration efforts uh, with the ASEAN Power Grid Initiative and the development of interconnected grid systems will further increase the uptake um, of the energy transition in the region. The transition is happening as we see it. And the question now is how fast can it be done and what needs uh, to be done to make this happen faster in Southeast Asia. With this, I come to the end of my presentation and we'll go uh, deeper into uh, a few of the key questions here as we progress into the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rao. Let us now take a look at the results of the poll. Question one on ranking the following priorities to revolutionize the change for the grid of the future. Most of the audience voted for strategic collaboration between countries. And on to the next question. What is the key challenge faced by the region in achieving a cross border grid? The audience have selected integrating diverse energy sources as a key challenge. Thank you. As we now begin the discussion, please use the Q&A feature to post your question. Let us know your name and organization and if your question is directed to a particular speaker. It is my pleasure to now invite Mr. Patrick Avery 
from GNW Electric Company, Mr. Hanzo Kumangbang from Suens, and Mr. Gabriel Yap from SP Group to join our moderator, Ms. Rao. Over to you, Ms. Rao. Thank you again, uh, Hidden. And uh, thank you everyone for enthusiastically participating in the, in the Menti uh, quiz. It really gives us insights into what everyone's thinking. Uh, th this afternoon, um, I, I welcome you all back to the panel, uh, panel discussion here. Uh, we have a distinguished panel of experts here today, um, and I'm really excited to host this panel. Um, the panelists here, uh, Mr. Patrick Avery, um, who's, who's dialing in all the way from Chicago, and, and, and it's uh, 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. his time, but thank you so much, Patrick, for doing this uh, and sharing your insights uh, from the other side of the world. Uh, we also have um, Hansel Chubanga uh, from Fluence and Mr. Gabriel Yap uh, from SP Power, Power Grid. Um, before before I invite everyone to introduce them, themselves, uh, just just um, just to kind of wrap the presentation there, uh, we've, we've talked about the energy transition, and the energy transition is fully underway around the world, uh, with a major shift from fossil fuels to re renewable energy by breakneck innovation, a type of capital that's following energy transition, evolving regulation, as well as business models that are rapidly developing. Um, we're, we're all on an everyday basis forging new equations to create value in the space. As companies and investors place decarbonization at the center of their strategy, societal and consumer pressures compel new forms of collaboration. And these forces as they come together, the forces of policy, investment, technological change, have put us in a place and set the dynamics that we've not seen in the energy sector for a long time. The countries in Asia have also uh, set their own renewable energy targets and already embarked on this journey to deploy large scale projects for solar, onshore, offshore wind, as well as distributor energy resources. However, the renewable energy resources remain intermittent and the sun shines when it shines and the wind blows when it does. So with this energy revolution that's ongoing, let's discuss in this panel um, how we develop a resilient and flexible grid of the future. Uh, to begin with, maybe I'll invite uh, the panelists to briefly introduce themselves and the work that they do and the organizations they work for. Um, may, I, may I first invite uh, Gabriel, please? Hi. Hi, everyone, uh, fellow industry colleagues and panelists. Uh, very good afternoon to you. I'm Gabriel Yap from uh, SP Power Grid. Currently, I'm heading the uh, section of operational digitalization. Uh, the section focuses on automating and harmonizing operations through technology applications for greater operational excellence and improved productivity. During my time in SP, I've had the uh, privilege to gain experience in areas of asset management, operations, and IT implementations. Also, the opportunity to lead several digitalization initiatives projects with key focus in driving productivity, fuel crew enablement, asset management, and automation. My main interest is in the use and adoption of technology in empowering the uh, workforce in this and for this new digital age. So um, actually happy to be part of the discussion today. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, uh, maybe uh, Hansel, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Samia. Hello, everyone. My name is Hansel Kubangbang. I'm the Senior Market Applications Officer at Fluence for the Southeast Asia region. And I basically focus on market growth and strategy in the region. I am an electrical engineer by profession, and I've been working with the electric power industry in the Philippines and Southeast Asia for more than 10 years now, uh, with, with more focus on renewable energy and energy storage integration. Nice to meet you, everyone. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Patrick, over to you. Yeah, I'm Patrick Avery. I have over 40 years experience in the power industry, starting my career with Westinghouse 
Electric Corporation, ABB, Cooper Power Systems, and currently with GNW. My title is Vice President of Power Grid Automation. We do all kinds of customized automation, ranging from automatic transfer schemes to providing turnkey microgrids. GNW has been in business since 1905, and we also manufacture current limiting fuses, cable accessories, sensors, and medium voltage distribution switchgear. Thanks for having me on the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, yeah, we clearly have experts uh, in the in the sector here um, on the call who have deep experience um, in, in, in the energy space. Um, with maybe I'll start off with the first question. Uh, with with the influx of renewable energy um, entering the grid, um, and the influx of renewable energy is inevitable. Uh, what do we see as the key challenges to increase the integration of this influx of renewable energy into the grid? As well as uh, what opportunities do we have here uh, to modernize the grid? to allow for this integration to be scalable. Uh, can I invite the panelists to share their experience uh, of what they've seen in their markets? Yeah, probably I can take up this question first. Uh, so let's take a look at this uh, from a Singapore's context. So uh, our emissions is expected to peak at 65 uh, metric tons CO2 equivalent by 2030. So um, Singapore's emission target is to achieve net zero emissions around mid-century. So I think to achieve this, um, the SG Green Plan 2030 um, is our national sustainability movement, which focuses on uh, five key pillars. So uh, namely a uh, city nature, sustainable living, uh, you're yeah, talking about green economy, resilient future, and of course, the one that um, probably we're most interested um, here is uh, energy reset, right? We have to use cleaner energy and increase our energy efficiency to lower our carbon footprint. So with that, actually, um, uh, from a, uh, that translates to some four key switches, right, from our uh, regulated EMA, which uh, we'll be looking at um, or key switches. Um, I think one area, one switch is the uh, natural gas. So about 95% of Singapore's electric city is generated using natural gas. So I think natural gas will still continue to be the dominant fuel in Singapore in the near future as we scale up the other four, uh, the other three switches. So I think uh, in this area, the government will help generation companies to improve the efficiencies of their power plants. Now, the next switch we are looking at is uh, regional power grids. So uh, Singapore will also explore ways to tap on um, regional power grids to assess energy that's clean and that is uh, cost competitive. So this could be realized through bilateral corporations or regional initiatives. So the target is actually to import up, up to uh, five gigawatt of electricity, right? And um, Going down to the third switch is, um, I think we also have to start looking into uh, emerging low carbon alternatives where look at uh, low carbon solutions where the potential to help to reduce Singapore's carbon footprint. I think looking at technologies such as uh, CCUS, uh, you're talking about carbon capture utilization or storage technologies, hydrogen, and even uh, geothermal energy. So these are clean uh, alternatives that uh, potentially uh, that are emerging. So um, lastly, but not the least, uh, we're talking about solar. So solar is one of the switch that um, remains to be Singapore's most promising renewable energy source. I think we are on track to reach our solar goal target of 1.5 gigawatt peak by 2025. Government is working towards achieving a new solar target of at least a two gigawatt peak by 2030. So the challenge with Singapore is that um, it's a dense city. So it means that um, there's limited land spaces for solar deployment. 
So um, this is where I feel the opportunity to is where uh, innovation comes. So for example, we, we are actually putting PVs on our rooftops, HDB rooftops. We are having PVs on our reservoirs, right? And of course, with solar power comes intermittency that may cause uh, voltage and frequency issues. So it requires proper system design and adequate leverage to respond to power system constraints. So I think um, another area of tech we're we looking at is uh, probably naturally is uh, energy storage system, ESS, right? Uh, this will allow us to address the intermittency issue uh, of solar. And then, um, and then there's also a target to actually deploy at least 200 megawatts uh, beyond uh, 2025. So I see that as uh, quite an opportunity. So I hope um, this gives a context of um, the challenges and uh, opportunities uh, to further our discussions. Yep. Yeah. So let me go next. Yeah. I believe with increased uh, integration of renewable energy in the grid, naturally it comes with intermittency, net load variability, or increased inter-hour ramp rates to support clean energy transition to move to a more sustainable future. I think the grid needs first flexibility, the second is more effective frequency regulation. Battery-based energy storage system have faster ramp rates compared to traditional resources. It can act as a generator and a load depending on the specific need of the grid. So by doing so, it provides additional flexibility to the grid to, bad, to better manage the challenges brought about by renewable energy. Energy storage has also proven to be the fastest provider of frequency response. Our installation in Ireland shows that with the right policy, the right support, closer coordination with the grid operators and key stakeholders. And of course, with the continuing development of our team, we have deployed uh, energy storage that can act as fast as 150 milliseconds. So by doing so, energy storage can react and respond faster to frequency variations brought about by intermittency and variability of renewable energy. So in summary, Energy storage is a key and integral part of this clean energy transition, particularly in supporting renewable energy integration. Okay, just to uh, elaborate on what the panelists said, uh, from my standpoint, the power grid for over a hundred years has been unidirectional, right? Power only went one way from the utility to the consumer. So the challenge now with uh, the advent of decentralized power is can the grid reliably handle bi-directional power flow? So utilities have been pretty prudent in evaluating each interconnection uh, based on the circuit's ability to handle the reverse power flow uh, from decentralized uh, renewable energy. And, and that continues to be the biggest challenge. A, a lot of times renewables can't be approved to be installed on the grid because the grid can't handle it. And the utility has to spend you know millions, possibly billions of dollars to uh, upgrade their circuits in, in order to handle it. Uh, the benefit though to decentralized power is grid resiliency. So from a consumer standpoint, you're not just reliant on the utility anymore for, for power. So when you have uh, severe uh, storms that happen uh, globally and cause uh, all kinds of problems, most importantly, loss of life, uh, consumers now have a reliable option to have their own power source from a renewable microgrid. Thank you, thank you everyone. Um, and yeah, um, like Patrick rightly mentioned, uh, utilities are usually uh, focused um, and have been doing this for hundreds of years. 
Uh, they focused on boosting service reliability and technology capabilities, at the same time controlling cost. We currently are living in a decade of climate action, and we need there's a need to build more flexible flexibility into the electricity grid, where we can scale up and down uh, supply based on demand, as well as bring more resiliency into the electricity grid. Uh, while distributed generation is uh, a part of it, uh, the, the grid needs to be able to withstand or if circumstances call for, also rapidly recover from disruptive events. And thirdly, also build a smarter grid uh, to be able to uh, have bi-directional flow uh, of electricity, as well as the other kind of transparency mechanisms that consumers of the future will demand for. Uh, as per the NEF uh, 2020 outlook, at least 14 trillion needs to be invested in the grid worldwide uh, by 2050 to really support this, what we talk about, the evolved power system. What technologies uh, would different countries really uh, look at to help with this grid modernization? Uh, can I invite the panelists to give their perspectives on the different technologies? and how you've seen it implemented in different countries on smartness, flexibility, and resiliency. Yep. Uh, I think uh, what we look at, uh, we go back to what are the challenges uh, before we look at uh, what are the technologies that you know can help us with grid modernization. So I think from a decarbonization and sustainability perspective, we will start to see um, bi bi-directional flows in distribution networks, as rightly mentioned by Patrick. And then of course, uh, the intermittency from renewable sources. Uh, we also be uh, you know, increasingly see uh, localized capacity demands from EV charging and uh, low carbon uh, electricity, electricity imports. And in terms of uh, continuing to be reliable and being resilient, I think um, the challenges here is the renewal and maintenance of aging assets, demand growth from new developments, um, interconnections between regional grids. So with all this uh, increasing complexity, right, the, the role of the future grid uh, has to be, has to change, has to evolve. And we're talking about uh, enabling sustainability with low carbon, low carbon technology, uh, enhanced reliability through uh, risk-based approach and the integrated management of electrical systems. So with this uh, roles, uh, it brings us to a few key enablers, right? So digitalization is a must going forward to meet or rather to optimize grid planning and operations. Uh, we, we should and must and uh, leverage on our technology to enhance grid capabilities efficient central management in a very distributed landscape. And of course, last but not least, uh, focusing on the workforce, a competent workforce, right, uh, to enable future roles. So let's take a look at uh, the uh, leveraging on the uh, on a techno technology angle, leveraging on technology angle. Um, I think with emissions, with all the emission targets that we are after, there will be a large push towards uh, renewable energy. So in Singapore context, I think, uh, for example, solar, as I mentioned, comes with intermittency causing voltage and frequency issues. So I think uh, to address that um, energy storage system will allow, uh, you know, uh, will allow us to address this issue and I think the opportunities are there in terms of uh, technology, right, to, to start installing ESS 
So in fact, I think uh, as you some you uh, mentioned in your in your paper uh, and your presentation that I think um, uh, EMA has awarded a two hundred megawatt ESS project to Semcorp uh, somewhere in the industrial area uh, in Jurong. So I think this is uh, sort of one area where I feel that um, you know these are the opportunities and technology that you know. Uh, uh, that can be embarked to, to help us with grid modernization. And a second aspect is that there's also a push for EV adoption. So we, in a Singapore context, again, we are looking at a target of uh, 60,000 EVs charging points by 2030, and are uh, expected to have about 600,000 EVs uh, by 2060 when we face out uh, internal combustion engines. So I think uh, EV are essentially a very small scale uh, mobile ESS, if you see it that way. So um, which has the potential to enhance uh, grid reliability to cater for demand on the power grid. So how can we harness the power of these little batteries that are running around the island? Right, I think that's where I feel, uh, uh, you know, uh, P2G vehicle to grid comes in. So I think for a, a bit of um, a bit of uh, background, I think uh, everybody is aware of, uh, you know, EV charging. I mean, a one way EV charging you're talking about is a kind of dumb charging. Uh, it gets a bit smarter when you are able to set a time of charge, and then uh, you have this. B1G, right? So that's where you have access to energy markets. You start uh, to, to be able to uh, set charging rates. And then there is this um, B2G, so uh, which gives us opportunity to essentially tap energy from uh, these little batteries in vehicles that run around the island, right? So, so of course, uh, depending on the policy setup, uh, you probably could be, you are able to sell the uh, energy back to grid. So I think last year, um, we partnered a V2G technological leader in Europe, uh, TMH, the Mobility House, and uh, we started our V2G trial. So this is actually for us to gain uh, operational experience of these systems. Um, so and in this trial, we're actually focusing on looking at battery degradation. I think as a as an owner of EV, or if you're owner of an EV that has a V2G function, actually you would be a natural concern that uh, you know you buy an EV, your battery could be uh, dead uh, you know, in the first two years after the charge and discharge. So this is an important area. And also uh, for our own area of concern, we are looking at harmonics and uh, frequency regulation uh, and its impact to our grid. So I think these are the two of the many areas that uh, technology can help with uh, grid modernization. I think for me, yeah, I think there is a wide variety of technologies out there that can support grid modernization. Some are still on the research and development phase. Some are already matured and it's out there in the market. A few of these few of these technologies are can be energy storage, can be dynamic compensating devices like statcom, static bar compensators, and grid forming capabilities and synchronous condensers. So these, I think, are the technologies that are already matured enough. But a, a comprehensive study is necessary to identify which of these technologies are really needed in the system, which can provide the most effective solution to the system. So it really depends on the country, but these are the, the I think the most mature technologies that there are right now in the market. Well, I'm encouraged to see the uh, global focus on sustainability. Uh, our customers more and more are requiring uh, long-term strategic plans from GNW on how we're going to provide sustainable solutions. Uh, within GNW, our own culture is to provide 
environmentally friendly, recyclable, clean energy technologies. So we are moving from the predominant uh, insulation of SS6 to solid dielectric. Uh, you can't meet all the ratings right now with so solid dielectric technology. So there are some hybrid, uh, more uh, sustainable and, and cleaner gases that we, we will uh, em employ. But the key is all renewable energy isn't clean, recyclable, and sustainable. So we have to focus on those technologies that don't harm the environment long term. They, they don't catch fire. They don't require landfill. They can be 100% re recyclable. And because the grid is decentralized, now you need um, more emphasis on high-speed communication with protocols like IEC 61850 and uh, super fast, uh, full of memory, uh, electronic uh, devices, relays and, and controls and, and sensors that can provide all of that information uh, back to the user so they know exactly how to manage the grid. Uh, I think the grid modernization is getting everyone um, quite excited and there are questions pouring in uh, from the audience as well. Uh, one of which is uh, about what are the emerging uh, technologies of the future that you actually see in emerging new technologies that you see um, could help in digitalization of the grid in the future? And what would be some of the, we've talked about smart grid technologies, uh, but what would be the key challenges in implementing these smart grid technologies? Gabriel, can I invite you on the question on um, the emerging and new technologies that will help accelerate digitalization of the grid? I think, um... Emerging technologies, we're looking at the uh, one of the areas would be, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the one of the key switches is we're looking at uh, emerging low carbon alternative. I think um, carbon capture and uh, utilization or storage technology. So essentially, it's about uh, harnessing carbon and then uh, you know, use it or store it for another form of usage. I think um, given that the cost of this, uh, cost of uh, this technology is still relatively high uh, as compared to, you're talking about, I think about 40 to 80 uh, US dollars per tonne. Uh, and compared to Singapore's uh, carbon tax, right, which is way much lower. So I think uh, the, 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 the uptake will be uh, kind of uh, limited by that. But I think as the technology starts to uh, mature, the prices definitely will, will go down. And um, I think that could be something viable. I think storage technology is... Uh, rather mature, but I think it's about uh, permissions that, you know, you're keeping the, uh, the the carbon as per what it is after storage, right? So that is the uh, part where uh, it's still not proven. So I think uh, this is one area that I think uh, uh, is, is where, we, where we see as a, a future technology. And then of course, I also mentioned about hydrogen, Again, uh, it's still uh, you know not a mature technology, but that's where the direction is to to be looking at. And then uh, I think in in one of the uh, reports that uh, we are looking at uh, geothermal energy, I think that is something that uh, well needs to be explored. And uh, of course, it's essentially a source of um, of energy. But I think. Um, 
if you start looking at uh, um, Singapore itself, right, it's the very, uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, land is a very, uh, you know, we, we have our very small land mass. So I think uh, um, even with solar at its peak, right, we, I think we are only about to, able to meet up to, I think, uh, Four percent of our uh, needs, right? So, so I think the the next logical um, avenue to go is uh, electricity import. So I think um, uh, Singapore actually is targeting of up to about uh, four gigawatts of uh, low carbon electricity imports by twenty thirty five uh, via both. Uh, HVAC and HVDC. I think, uh, as you mentioned uh, last year in your in your earlier presentation, that uh, you know we there was recently announced that Singapore started to import power from Laos, hydroelectric power, clean energy, hundred megawatts of those. So I think that hundred megawatts is about um, one hundred fifty thousand four room flats for powering hundred and fifty k. Uh, forum HDB flats for about a year. So I think uh, going through Laos, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore uh, uh, through a power integration project. So I think, so So the, the key thing here is that I think uh, access to low carbon energy beyond shores and diversifying our energy sources is important uh, because that will predominantly, you know, aside from solar, uh, will help us achieve our low carbon uh, goals. And of course, by doing so, I think it opens up uh, the market, right? Uh, you know, Singapore is uh, readily going to start importing renewable energy from the region, right? That actually also supports uh, the regional decarbonization efforts, right? Uh, of course, uh, with that happening, I think the private sectors will start looking at uh, uh, economic opportunities for our neighbors around the region because you, you, know, you know if you were to set up a, a solar farm I mean you will be looking at a large uh, land mass where I think uh, our neighboring countries or even uh, in Australia right you're able to put in those huge solar farms and then um, harness clean renewable energy uh, for export uh, so I think so I think it's sort of um, with, with that kind of uh, drivers, it sort of paves the uh, uh, economy opportunities uh, for for private and of course our neighbors, uh, you know, to start investing in 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 this area. So so I feel that um, these are you know some of the uh, enablers that I feel that you know, or key drivers for even private sector or even our, our some of the regional partners to, to take a more active role. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, Hansel, specifically in the battery storage uh, side, can, can you share a little more about emerging technologies that, that, that you think may uh, become real applications in the near future? Yeah. In the energy storage industry, there are only a few applications right now that we're, that we're seeing. First is the frequency regulation. The second is on, on capacity firming renewable energy. So those are the two main applications that we're seeing in the market right now. But we in Fluence, we have developed more than 40 applications already for different applications, for different grid, for different customers. So we, we have developed different applications specific to the need of the customer. One trend that we may see in the future, in the very near future, is the virtual transmission line. So we know that renewable energy can be built in, within 12 months. You know, the transmission line, it, it would take around five years to develop, right? It would take very long to secure permits, right of way. So it would take the grid operator a very long time to develop the transmission line. But energy storage at the same time can be developed within nine to 12 months. So, you know, the, the timeline of renewable energy and the timeline of energy storage can be very similar. So by doing that, by, by installing energy storage, it can support renewable energy 
and then and in some cases it can it can provide virtual transmission line capability so by installing energy storage at that at, at both end of the transmission line we can increase the capacity of the transmission line and then at the same time it can provide frequency regulation voltage regulation and in some cases it can also provide synthetic inertia so those applications right now we're seeing some interest we're receiving some some queries some requests to, to provide more information but i think that the key here is there should be a policy there should be a framework there should be a tariff structure for such service because you know private sectors has been very active they they have been very active in pushing for this technology they're they're just waiting for the right market signal to, to make it happen yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sanjay. Uh, with battery technology um, uh, emerging and 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 kind of moving so quickly, um, and you said you're working on forty different type of technologies uh, at the, at this time, which which would come to the market in the future. Um, the the typical lifespan of a battery is typically shorter than what you would see of other power generation projects. Um, so there's a question from the audience on what happens to the batteries at the end of life and where's the recycling and kind of technology related to that, uh, how's that evolving? Mm -hmm. Can I invite you to share your thoughts on that? Yeah. So first on, on battery recycling, we, we have an agreement with the battery suppliers. So we, we can, after, after their life, after the life of the sales, the, the manufacturer can collect it and then they can recycle it. At the same time, we influence have that capability as well. So we can collect the batteries on our own and then recycle it. So it's it's more sustainable than others think because we have that mechanisms already in place. Okay. Um, in 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 particular, in um, applications of battery technology and how private sector um uh, are involved in helping finance that can you share 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 a little more about how you've seen this evolve mm -hmm. in the philippines yeah so so yeah a brief background in the philippines in the philippines the grid operator cannot own and operate energy storage they, they, they simply cannot it's it's in the rules it's in the regulation so but the grid operator is mandated to procure ancillary services so they, they can procure service or the energy storage, but they cannot own and operate energy storage. So by doing that, it brought uh, the idea of energy storage as a service kind of a model. So private sector will, will develop, will install the battery. It has to be certified. It has to be tested by the grid operator. And then by doing that, the, the energy storage, the facility can provide ancillary services for five years with a fixed rate. So it's it's more of an energy storage as a service mm -hmm. model in the Philippines because the grid operator cannot own and operate uh, energy storage such as this. And then in, in some other cases, right now we're seeing is more on the power purchase agreement or power supply agreement. So in that case, the, the energy storage is providing ancillary services to the grid. And in, in other cases, energy storage is connected to a renewable energy, may it be solar or a wind. So energy storage will firm up the capacity of the solar and the wind. And then by doing that, the facility, the hybrid facility will be able to provide long-term power supply agreement to distribution utilities. Uh, the duration of which can, can range from 15 to 25 years. And the, the rates that we're seeing right now is, is, is making sense, it's making financial sense. So is that, I mean, for, for, for that kind of a model, it's where we're, we're seeing such trend right now. And in fact, we've seen in the news articles that, that there's a developer who have committed a 850 megawatt mid-merit power supply. So that 850 megawatt uh, mid-merit power supply contains maybe around 3.5 to 5 gigawatts of solar, and then around 4.5 to 5 gigawatt hours of, of energy storage. So with the completion of that, it will be considered the largest, largest solar farm and largest energy storage in the world. Uh, thanks, Sandra. Uh, so the battery can really kind of sit in different places in, yeah. in the value chain. Uh, as, as you said, it can sit at, with the tra transmission service operator, 
or, or sit outside uh, owned by a private sector operator, but with the revenue stream and application coming into the transmission service operator or uh, move to firm capacity with the renewable energy project developer as well. Um, so there's various um, uh, parts of the value chain where private sector can really bring in this these grid modernization technologies and yeah. integration and technologies to integrate renewable energy uh, into into the modern grid. Yeah, um, Patrick, I think we lost you for a little while there, but um, yeah, sorry um, about that. <laughs> no worries. Uh, can, can can you share um, what you've seen uh, in in your part of the world on? grid resiliency and how, how government's kind of putting more into the grid resiliency and what are the key changes that you're seeing um, or, or the key technologies that you're seeing uh, being built in, um, in in response to the recent kind of climate events um, in, in uh, America? Yeah, uh, but I'm going to speak globally because the trends are, believe it or not, the same uh, globally. So you know, everybody is exposed to severe uh, climate change. And so globally, utilities are uh, designing and implementing more power systems that are underground. So you have major utilities uh, starting in the US, like uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, who uh, went through all kinds of financial problems because of all the fires. Uh, that were experienced and, and they were sued. And so they came back in full force and said, hey, look, we're going to take all of our lines and, and put them underground. And so the challenge that gives to suppliers like us is we have to provide submersible equipment. Uh, fortunately for us, all of our equipment is, is submersible. It's tested to uh, 20 feet of water for, for 20 days. And, and so globally, we, we have uh, uh, submersible installations of uh, distribution uh, switch gear. And that is proving to be one of the most uh, resilient uh, solutions in, in the industry. Uh, but getting back to re renewables, renewables are becoming more competitive. Um, I'm not sure if the incentives that we experience in the US are the same uh, globally, uh, but because there is significant incentives uh, for what I'm gonna call the uh, commercial and industrial uh, segment uh, of the market, which includes manufacturers like GNW, uh, to deploy uh, microgrids, we're seeing a, a huge increase in the installation of microgrids in, in the private sector. So from a resiliency standpoint, you're gonna see a lot more underground systems and you're gonna see a lot more uh, microgrids. Uh, thank you, thank you, Patrick. In, in getting the microgrids into actually implementation, have you seen any kind of key um, technology challenges or regulatory challenges that that hinder private sector from using using these applications for microgrid? Yeah, as, as I mentioned earlier, one of the biggest regulatory challenges is being able to get the interconnection agreement from the utility to to apply your your microgrid uh, to their their power grid, you know, as I mentioned, uh, in in a lot of cases, the utilities' power grid can't handle the large influx of of microgrid applications, and so unfortunately, you're seeing uh, a lot of uh, microgrid projects uh, fail just because of of, of that uh, uh, situation. Uh, thanks, Patrick. I think that's where, uh, again, going back to the flexibility in the grid and how, how we could bring in applications to actually be able to match supply and demand uh, comes back in. Um, yeah. We have many questions pouring in from the audience. Uh, one in particular here, um, sorry, we won't be able to go through all of them, but one in particular here talks about 
how do how do how does the panelist panelists here uh, see the future potential for peer to peer renewable energy trading and virtual power plants in in the countries that you operate uh, where different battery systems uh, could be within um, could be within electric vehicles or could be uh, backup storage uh, that buildings have uh, that can be used to draw power together um, and have have capacity to actually be able to pull together a virtual power plant. Um, have you worked on any such uh, technology projects um, and understand the regulatory challenges and challenges to implement this on a large scale? Yeah, I'm I'm encouraged by what's happening, at least in, in the U.S. Our independent system operators, uh, led by uh, PJM, which is one of our, our biggest and most innovative uh, independent system operators, uh, they provide some pretty lucrative payments for participation in frequency regulation. Uh, so that's one of the key ways that you can pay for your, your microgrid in, investment from a private sector standpoint. Uh, so the increase in peer-to-peer -peer trading uh, between uh, commercial and industrial customers in the grid uh, through independent system operators is, is very encouraging and it's going to be an exciting part of our, our future. Um, thank you, Patrick. Mm, the, we have another question from the audience on um, what are the implications of cyber attack on a smart grid? And um, if if the panelists here have seen um, or studied this and and really thought about how to prevent or minimize this um, as as a as a grid operator. Yeah, so in, in the US, we've had several instances where actual end users, uh, commercial and industrial customers were, were attacked, uh, not so much uh, on our, our, our power grid, but, but more on an individual private sector uh, basis. Uh, and so what's happening uh, is that many of the relay and controls, you know, any kind of intelligent electronic device manufacturer are starting to add more stringent cyber security at that device level. Uh, and I personally think uh, that's the best way to do it. Now you can do it, you know, from a, a communication network standpoint too, uh, but in my humble opinion, the grid is more susceptible to hacking on an individual device basis. So it's the end end uh, end use uh, where you really um, uh, put the cybersecurity in rather than leave it for the grid operator to manage all of it. Right. Um, Gabriel, you mentioned about human capital and how human capital and um, uh, people people management is quite crucial in ensuring long term sustainable asset management of a modernized grid. Uh, can you take a Talk a little more about how, how you're going about with the capacity building uh, initiatives to, to have the manpower of the future grid um, ready. I think um, in terms of, uh, let's uh, probably looking at uh, cap capability building uh, in terms of, let's uh, talk about electricity imports. So I think uh, uh, there's always uh, talk and you know, we are starting uh, import of uh, HVDC connections. So, so from that area, um, I mean, traditionally our grid, uh, we do not operate uh, DC uh, assets. So I think um, with this uh, HVDC connection upcoming, right? So um, there, there comes a point where we are actually building capability, uh, understanding how we can operate the uh, and operate and maintain uh, this equipment, um, and then of course, this is of course in 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 view of uh, you know the future 
that uh, you know we we're gonna get uh, electricity imports uh, coming in uh, as a HVDC. So of course, and, and that is of course from an energy import perspective, but from a from a uh, own a fuel crew perspective, I think um, generally uh, if you are talking about asset management and operations, uh, traditionally it is always uh, you know uh, it's we have been a very uh, paper based utility. Right, so I think the as as we start to have more and more information and data available through various sources of uh, digitalization, I think that is where our workers and a few crew, um, you know, generally have uh, are, are impacted. And I think um, this is where I think uh, in terms of capability and rescaling, rescaling has has to happen. And um, uh, this is an important area where, where you know, uh, with, with that, right? And I think uh, the the because your the data that you actually you're gonna collect out in the field, right? Or uh, um, is only as good as uh, you know the operator or the field crew uh, uh, accuracy of uh, getting this data. So. Again, if if you are not competent in data collection and uh, knowing how to operate some of the uh, interconnected uh, enterprise system, then I think that there, there lies the bottleneck uh, in you know, trying to uh, modernize the the grid operations. Thanks, thanks, Gabriel. Um, there's there's another question that's coming. I think this is more for uh, Hansen. Um, there's a question on the future of flow battery. Um, as I, I, in your role, are you able to share your view on how you see this space evolving? Yeah, uh, actually, we've been receiving as well some some queries about flow batteries, but influence uh, what we're seeing right now is really for for a more compact type of energy storage such as lithium ion, LFP, and LMCs. So right now, that's the trend that we're seeing right now. We, we've been receiving queries about low batteries and other types of, 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 of chemistries as well. But that's the trend that we're seeing right now. The, 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 the customers want a more compact, uh, more energy dense type of energy storage. Uh, I'd like to speak on that because we're in the process of installing a uh, flow battery on our campus. And I'll tell you the reasons why we chose flow. And also, if you look at the market data, you'll find that in the next five to seven years, flow batteries should outpace the installation of lithium ion batteries. And the main reason for it is flow batteries last a minimum of 20 years. They're environmentally friendly, meaning they don't catch fire uh, at the end of life. You don't have to put them in a landfill like you do with lithium ion. So the public is getting a lot more demanding from an environmentally friendly standpoint and a long duration standpoint. The biggest difference between flow and lithium ion is lithium ion is minutes to hours. Flow is hours to days. Okay, so if you're going to have a more resilient grid and you have these major storms, you're going to be out for days, right? So you need a long duration uh, uh, solution. Uh, so that's one of the main reasons why we, we picked uh, vanadium redux uh, flow battery over lithium ion. And I really think uh, that represents the future of, of energy storage. It's in the flow battery, not lithium ion. Yeah, and to add to the point of battery, it really depends on the application. So for frequency regulation, so for a more short duration type of application, lithium ion, that's what we're seeing right now. It provides a faster response. But as mentioned by Patrick earlier, that for a longer duration battery, it makes financial sense for, for, for flow batteries. Really. Uh, as mentioned by Patrick, if you, if you have a typhoon, and then you'll experience a blackout for, for several hours, several days, flow batteries can really help. 
Well, remember I said earlier that one of the biggest return on investments is to participate in frequency regulation. Yeah. Well, we're doing that with our flow battery. There is no decrease in, in performance. And the biggest difference is the more you use lithium ion for frequency regulation, the faster you end its life. So on average, lithium ion batteries last between five and seven years. As I mentioned, a flow battery lasts a minimum of 20 years. So in that time, you have to buy three lithium ion batteries for the price of one flow battery. Yeah, I mean, that really depends on how you use the batteries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for frequency regulation, you really are not using it zero to maximum every time. So it depends on the grid that you're connected on. I mean, in particular in the Philippines, we're not experiencing one, we're not experiencing more than one cycle a day. So really, it really depends on the application, how the battery will be there. It, oh, it, also, it also depends on how sustainable and environmentally friendly you want to be too. We, we can't just isolate certain factors in the evaluation of the technology. We have to look at it based on total life cycle costs and all the factors. And I'm saying when you evaluate it based on all of the factors, flow batteries will win every time. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting to have all these evolving technologies as well as proven technologies and how yeah. they'll be commercially applied uh, in the future and uh, how, how, how they evolve and adapt uh, to the threat of the future. Maybe just as closing remarks, um, I'll invite each of the panelists to give your view on how you see the grid of the future in the region and what do you see as the biggest benefit uh, from the grid of the future to, to, to the people that live in the region? Yep, okay. Can so, I invite Gabriel? I, yeah, thank you. Sure. <laughs> So I think in summary, uh, we are talking about uh, increased complexities due to decarbonization, sustainability, reliability, and resilience needs. So um, the role of the future of the grid is about en enabling sustainability, right, with low carbon technology, enhanced reliability through risk-based approach, and uh, integrated management of uh, electrical systems. So where we are looking at key enablers, such as digitalization, leveraging technology, efficient management, and last but not least, a competent workforce, right? I think for Singapore remains a uh, renewable energy challenged due to our limited land space. Uh, even with our plans to indigenously produce uh, renewable energy through our rooftops and uh, floating solar installation, we will not be able to sort of uh, replace the country's needs. I think at best, solar is expected to only fulfill about 4% of the country needs by 2030. So in the long-term net zero carbon emission goal, uh, we have to turn to our neighbors, um, you know, uh, in one area is to provide a clean energy supply through imports and integration with our regional power grids. So as part of energy security, uh, we will need to diversificate, we will need diversification uh, and imports from uh, various countries. Also, uh, through the exploration of uh, new technologies such as uh, CCUS, hydrogen, uh, geothermal, and potentially maybe uh, nuclear, uh, for which uh, cost I think still remains high, but uh, technology expected to uh, mature in the near future. And finally, I personally believe that uh, through digitalization and with abundance of data and information, um, business can and should optimize their operations, reduce uh, wasteful deployments, and this will eventually uh, you know, uh, lower their carbon footprint. Yep. Thank you for... Yeah, I think 
in the future we will be seeing more and more renewable energy that's that's gonna happen and it will happen so we just have to put in some some measures we have to prepare for that future so there, there has been several technologies already that's already matured enough to cater such change to cater such clean energy transition we just have to tap on those technologies we just have to to kind of uh use those technologies to our advantage energy storage has been there for a very long time but we're not seeing such technology in, in other parts of southeast asia so really it should start within ourselves there, there should be some policy support there should be some framework so it should it should start within the regulation itself for, for us to be able to tap these technologies to move forward towards a more sustainable future Yeah, I, I agree with you. The, the future of the power grid is increasingly more two-way power flow, and it poses some challenges for the industry, uh, but I feel really good about our ability to uh, become better partners uh, in the power grid industry. And when I say that, I mean between utilities and, and, and users. You know, more and more, we, we need each other in, in order to uh, ensure that the grid stays reliable and uh, becomes more resilient. So the utility needs to work closer with commercial and industrial customers to ensure that when we fire up our microgrids, we, we don't damage uh, the power grid. and, and and we provide a, a net benefit to the grid instead of uh, a, a major uh, uh, detriment. And I'm encouraged by this process because we've just gone through it. And we started out in an adversarial relationship with our utility, uh, ComEd, uh, just be, because of, of, of what I told you. you. You know, the utility is used to supplying power uh, one way and, and not you know, taking power the, the other way. But we were able to sit down with them and, and draw up a, a, a plan so that we both mutually benefit uh, from the advent and energization of our microgrid. And, and I, I think more and more that's going to happen. It has to happen uh, in the future. Uh, thank you, thank you, everyone, um, uh, for for your active participation. I think uh, the um, audience in the previous Menti poll also kind of talked about how they see the priorities are, and it's very much in line uh, where there needs to be a strategic collaboration between countries to be able to revolutionize the change that we expect in the grid of the future. Um, going after that, we really need stronger policy frameworks. Uh, to, to be able to operationalize these um, and give the right market signals. Greater investment in R&D, uh, bringing CCUS and other uh, technologies really um, to the market at a viable price. And, and then development of smart technologies really to build uh, a smarter grid of the future. Uh, thank you everyone for your enthusiastic participation as well as uh, the audience for the, for the questions that keep rolling in. Uh, sorry, we couldn't answer all of them, but we've tried to answer as many as many as we could. Thank you very much to our speakers and moderator for the engaging and insightful session. We have now come to the end of the Steel Energy Insights webinar series. Do note that a recording of the session will be made available online. We look forward to meeting you at CO 2022 this October at Marina Bay Sands, Singapore. Thank you for joining us today and have a great evening ahead.